I actually wanted to start my talk today by thanking Bia. For those of you that know, don't know Bia Labate, she's an amazing, amazing woman who's done a lot of work in the world of ayahuasca research and uh, did a lot of hard, hard work to put this whole track together this year. So thank you, Bia. All right, so I'm gonna start with a basic definition of trauma. PTSD is a very complex disorder, so I'm gonna keep it pretty vague. Um, trauma is a deeply distressing or disturbing experience that creates an unresolved impact on an individual. You know, based on that definition, how many of you here can actually say you yourselves personally or somebody very dear to you have experienced trauma? You know, exactly, there's quite a few of us. And, that in and of itself is what has driven me um, to get involved in the PTSD research. Um, I've encountered trauma consistently through my life, whether it be personally or watching a close friend who was in a car accident in high school, which his father was tragically killed in, or I worked in an ER, as Brian mentioned, and currently I'm working with veterans and I hear the intensity of their combat stories. Um, and so with that, I saw how prevalent um, trauma is in the world. The tragedy is, is that victims often don't even realize that their symptoms that they experience often for years or even decades are a result of their trauma. They struggle in this sort of purgatory of anxiety that they're unable to identify or describe. Mental illness represents not a cognitive impairment, but an attempted interpretation of an inexplicable, of inexplicable internal states. Essentially, PTSD is a pathological state of fear. Um, one of the biggest challenges to PTSD treatment is that it's very unresponsive to the current treatment modalities. There's a lot of treatment resistance. For those that actually do seek treatment, they're often left feeling helpless because the, there's a limited capacity in the current treatments to actually help them find resolution. This suggests that we absolutely need to find more th therapeutic strategies. The other problem being that there's a lot of stigma, both in the general public and in the medical community as a whole. PTSD victims often are known as drug seeking or people who are completely uncompliant. So they'll start treatment, but then they won't come back and follow up. Um, the sad story is, is that most of them, you know, turn to addiction just because they're trying to find their own sort of coping mechanisms to help suppress their debilitating symptoms. And then those that are seeking treatment, um, treatment in its initial stages can often activate these individuals, making their symptoms worse at first. So them not coming back to treatment is a direct result of them being avoidant of their symptoms. An additional obstacle lies within the stigma that the clinicians that are providing treatment themselves have. Um, in general, a clinician's level of discomfort in prescribing medications increases as the risk of the abuse of the medication increases. Unfortunately, difficult to treat mental health disorders such as PTSD um, are also the ones that are best managed by controlled substances. So for instance, benzodiazepines are phenomenal at treating kind of the hyperarousal symptoms around PTSD, but clinicians don't like handing out prescriptions of Xanax. You know, if victims remain feeling helpless and clinicians are resistant to treating them, we need to find a new therapeutic, we need to explore new therapeutic potentials. Substances such as MDMA and DMT, which is a psychoactive component in ayahuasca, are both considered category one controlled substances. And this means they have a high potential for abuse and are not considered acceptable, acceptable for medical use. Kind of funny to think of ayahuasca as something that's an abusable substance, because those of you who have experienced it know that it's not always exactly pleasurable, but uh, in the long term, you can be very happy for the experience. But the point here being is that Understanding the therapeutic potential of certain controlled substances provides a key to what current medicine struggles to find, which is a solution for victims. So briefly, I'm gonna to explain to you guys um, the evolution of the human brain. Um, this is called the triune brain. So first evolved our reptilian brain, uh, and this is our instinctive mind. It's responsible for basic things like survival, food, and sex. 
And then there's our mammalian brain, which is our emotional brain. It's where our limbic system is, and also um, the hippocampus and the amygdala, which I'm going to talk more about in the following slides, are part of the limbic system. And then there's our human brain, the neocortex, which is intellect, our analytical minds. So our human brain is our conscious brain. It's what allows for consciousness. But then our subconscious lies in the mammalian and the reptilian brains. Uh. So the major systems at the core of the traumatic reaction are located within the mammalian and the reptilian brain levels in our emotional and our physiologic responses, so the subconscious. And it is at this level what we need to target where healing really truly begins. Ultimately, the primary goal of treatment for PTSD is to allow for the opportunity to free the subconscious memories to finally be processed and integrated into the victim's life with meaning without replaying the original emotional intensity. And so what ayahuasca does, it provides a landscape to explore and unleash what has been trapped in the subconscious regions of the brain. So now I'm gonna describe the different systems a little bit more. Um, our memory system is actually much more complex than this, but simply put, you have implicit and explicit memory, which are formed in our amygdala and our hippocampus, respectively. And then the memories are stored in our prefrontal cortex. Implicit memory is our somatic memory. It's memories of our experiences that are not, we're not consciously aware of, but our bodies are. So like remembering how to ride a bike, for instance. And then our expl explicit memory is our conscious memory. And it's what allows us to recall from previous experiences and previous information. So what occurs in trauma is that we are able to create the implicit memory but without the explicit memory to consciously make sense of it all. So when a victim experiences a stimuli kind of reminiscent of the traumatic event, they experience similar sensations um, that occurred as if they were right there. So they feel all the same fear and anxiety. One of the most effective treatments um, in psychotherapy is exposure therapy. And it's also considered one of, it's one of the fastest treatments out there for PTSD at this time. And what they do in exposure therapy is the person's exposed to an implicit memory of the event, and, but it's done in a safe and controlled environment, creating an opportunity to integrate the information and resolve the pathological trauma memory. So it decreases the intensity of disturbing emotions by helping people change how they react to the memories. And it, Research that Jordi Reba's done, they've actually found that ayahuasca activates the emotional processing regions of the brain. So the frontal and paralimbic brain regions, which are where the amygdala and the hippocampus lie. Next is the HPA axis, um, which is also known as the limbic hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So what happens is, is our bodies, um, first sense the stressful stimulus in the amygdala, which is then relayed to the HPA axis. It's our body's stress response system. It's what releases cortisol and adrenaline. So the main function of the HPA axis in relation to trauma is that it guides emotions to stimulate behavior for survival, our flight or fight response. It also processes memories. Trauma disrupts the negative feedback mechanisms of the HPA axis. So when we would normally the negative feedback would normally turn off the fight or flight response, and this doesn't actually occur for people with traumatic exposure. So we're, they're chronically in a state of arousal. And this chronic state of arousal also suppresses the hippocampus, so it prevents the formation of the explicit memory, tr thus tra trapping the traumatic memories in the implicit system. Although it may seem a little counterintuitive to reactivate the HPA axis to aid in healing, as mentioned in exposure therapies, if it's done in a safe and controlled environment, it creates the opportunity to identify, reorganize, and neutralize environmental triggers and symptoms. In an article by Dos Santos, they saw a robust activation of the HPA axis with ayahuasca administration. And the last system I'm going to go over is the serotonergic system. Um, basically, in uh, PTSD, what you see is a decreased level of serotonin, which thus leads to the decreased ability to modulate arousal and leads to the dysfunction and the regulation of the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. 
Um, first line pharmacotherapy um, for PTSD treatment is with antidepressants, which increase serotonin levels in the brain. Um, previous studies by Jordi Reba um, and Callaway show that their serotonergic activism is central effects of ayahuasca and that the regular use of ayahuasca can lead to the long-term modulation of serotonin systems in the brain. Since serotonin is involved in multiple mental health disorders, it's hypothesized that there's a direct link between the elevation of serotonin transporters seen with long-term ayahuasca use and thus be positive behavioral changes. Um, Miss that, that just kind of shows the pathways that are targeted by uh, PTSD in relation to ayahuasca. And a quote that I wanted to read to you guys is by a psychologist named Peter Levine who's really famous in the work of trauma research. And the quote is, it is to our detriment that we live in a culture that does not honor the internal world. In many cultures, the internal world of dreams, feelings, images, and sensations is sacred. Yet most of us are only peripherally aware of its existence. We have little or no experience of finding our way around in this internal landscape. Consequently, when, we are, when our experience demands it, we are unprepared. So victims of PTSD were unprepared for this stressful event that altered their lives. And ayahuasca can help guide them into their internal landscape, assisting them to access their own personal internal resources for resolution. Research shows that ayahuasca targets the brain systems disrupted by PTSD. And by studying, by studying ayahuasca, we may be able to unleash what conventional medicine has failed to provide for victims. Thank you, and Jessica. There you go. So I'm, I'm gonna change gears a bit, and um, I'm gonna show you um, a demo of the method that we propose to use to analyze ayahuasca for PTSD. So I'm a neuroscientist at UCSF where I, we use these bioinformatics frameworks to try and understand and cure spinal cord injuries. So I'm gonna show you it within the context of that just to kind of give you a demo. So what people typically go, do to understand these complex um, diseases like spinal cord injuries, they measure all of these functional outcomes and then try to correlate each of them together to understand what's happening to the patient. And it creates, as you can see, this very complex network of correlations that's really difficult to understand um, in its totality, especially when you want to understand how this whole thing's responding to a particular treatment. Um, so what our system does is it essentially reduces down this complexity into what we're calling um, syndromic features of functional recovery for our disease model. And what this does is it takes hundreds or thousands of variables and puts them into this bivariate correlation matrix where we can basically reduce the dimensionality of this data set to get these multivariate syndrome measures that um, highlight and um, illustrate what what the intersection is of all of these different variables and how they're moving together in a multivariate space as a result of um, treatment. Um, and so this is an example of, of a three-dimensional plot of subjects after doing this syndromic analysis following spinal cord injury. The black subjects here are um, subjects that had no injury, and the colored dots are um, subjects that had varying severities of spinal cord injury. And so what one dimension differentiates is that subjects were injured, and then a separate dimension will differentiate the different um, subcomponents of injury severities. And then we can then test whether any treatment is, is shifting subjects into different um, realms within this three-dimensional space. And so this is just another way to visually represent this. This is topological data analysis where it takes the, um, the fundamental nature of the shape of your big multivariate data set and it, it clusters subjects together based on shared features in this network um, and then clusters them together into these nodes and then will connect different groups of subjects based on shared features in the data set. And this is just a prettier example of that. Um, so this method was proposed or was presented to some of our neurosurgeon colleagues at um, UCSF where they, have, um, they had this very large traumatic brain injury data set that they've been collecting data for for the past decade. And when they applied this um, type of data analysis to their data set, what they found was that there was a, a separate cluster of subjects that just had PTSD, um, that completely separated out from those that had traumatic brain injury. And so this got me thinking that this could be a really useful tool, potentially, to really understand what's happening with PTSD and um, potentially different therapeutic strategies, strategies to fix it. Um, so this happens to be um, a visual representation. This is a network topology of a PTSD clinical trial 
um, that was recently conducted where the drug of interest was MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And so what's great about this network topology, it's essentially a map of the data set in this multivariate representation. And what you can do is you can color code based on the variables that you want to see and how they play out in this data set. And so here I've color coded where the inactive placebo subjects are located and where the MDMA subjects are located. And this is in a partnership with a, a visualization software here in the, um, a visualization company here in the Bay Area. Um, and these subjects actually were excluded from the study. They withdrew from the study at some point, and so you'd normally consider these outliers and may not potentially assess these in your study, but even if we do throw these into this framework, they still differentiate out. So it's a pretty good tool to really map out where your subjects are in this, uh, this network topology. So this is one of the functional outcome measures that was reported. I'm not reporting anything novel here in terms of the, the conclusions of the study. I'm just applying a different method to look at um, what the results are. And so this is the um, clinical assessment of PTSD, the CAP score, um, color-coded um, prior to MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And essentially, red means that they have PTSD, and blue means they don't. And again, I just want to remind you where the placebo subjects are and where the MDMA subjects are. And after treatment, pretty much all the guys that got the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy no longer have symptoms of PTSD. And this was confirmed with another measure, which is a self-report of PTSD, where you also see this recovery in the treated subjects. Um, one thing I did notice when I looked at this was these subjects here didn't seem to recover as well as some of the other ones. And um, these were guys that were, in fact, in the MDMA group. So I explored the data set a little bit more to figure out what could potentially be causing these guys to not respond as well to the treatment. And it turns out that it's, um, when I looked at their medical history, it was the fact that these guys um, didn't have any prior history of ecstasy use. Um, so not really necessarily reporting that as a finding, I'm just letting you know that this is a useful tool that we could potentially have to assess PTSD clinical trials and, and potentially could be a good screening process to understand um, how subjects fall within a larger um, syndromic network. So how does this relate to PTSD? Um, so I have a personal interest in PTSD. I happened to go down to Peru in 2010 um, serendipitously with a group of war veterans who had pretty severe PTSD. And I was able to witness the transformation of these guys from the beginning of the trip to the end of the trip. And they had remarkable recovery um, during the course of the ayahuasca therapy. And so we've um, kept in touch on Facebook and an email. Um, and they still report that they don't suffer from these detrimental side effects of PTSD. Um, and so I mined some of their trip reports that they actually posted in some of their blogs on Facebook and did a word frequency cloud. Um, and it turns out these guys really do believe that this is a medicine for their PTSD. And so there's not really any studies happening right now to look at ayahuasca for PTSD, but there's so much anecdotal evidence out there from the community that this is causing, um, this is really causing people to have amazing recovery from various ailments, including PTSD. Um, so we have a collaboration set up with the Petiti Institute in Peru where um, we plan to do a retrospective data collection of subjects with PTSD that have been going down there voluntarily to take ayahuasca. Um, so we need to get an IRB to get this protocol approved um, and to be able to retrospectively collect the data and contact the subjects and hopefully do follow-up interviews to see how they're doing after they've taken ayahuasca and hopefully mine their medical history in order to see if there's any um, potential uh, risk factors or other things that might be indicating whether they'll be more responsive or not to this treatment that can provide rationale so we can hopefully do a prospective observational study at multiple healing centers as well as hopefully a um, double-blind clinical trial at some point, uh, where in which case I would use the syndromics approach to look at the clinical trials and different therapies for PTSD, including NBMA and ayahuasca. So uh, I'd just like to thank MAPS uh, for donating their data so I could kind of show you proof of concept of how this works. Um, this data visualization company, IOSTI, um, which we've partnered up with, with funding from the Nielsen Foundation, no relation, um, as well as NINDS, which is the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Strokes, which funds my spinal cord injury research. And for those of you that like to look into references, here's some of the um, uh, citations from the information that was cited in this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia and Jessica. So we have just a few moments for questions and just a reminder for all the talks of this afternoon. Uh, please just ask one question and try to be brief and we'll see how many we can answer for you all. Thank you. Uh, you were present in Peru when those guys uh, recovered. 
I'm looking for um, the catharsis, information about catharsis. Did you see anything special in, in this process? Um, there was one guy I noticed who, um, the first ayahuasca session he did, it kind of broke him down and he, was, uh, he couldn't stop crying after it was over and, then, and then he did another ayahuasca session and then he was able to kind of build him back up. So I think there was a release and then a, a coming back together and then he was a lot stronger and happier and that's, that's maintained to this day. And I just kind of want to poke in here. Uh, you know, catharsis often focuses on more of the conscious part of our brains. And one of the things that I'm saying is that we really need to focus on the subconscious regions in or for trauma treatment. And so with ayahuasca, you really get into those deeper areas. So you get the sensations and the emotions that you can heal so that eventually, you know, you can get to the conscious side of things as well. Hi, um, I wanted to ask if you collected any physiological data, um, and uh, if you did, what kind? Or if not, um, do you intend to uh, down the line, or does MAPS intend to down the line? Um, maybe to try to understand uh, things from maybe a mechanistic perspective. Uh, yeah, we would like to collect anything we can get our hands on um, to see if there's you know any potential things that we can identify as risk factors or um, things that are gonna help them recover better. I mean, so to me, I'm a data scientist, so I like to get all the information and see what kind of things co-vary together in a multivariate space. So I think physiology measures would be crucial for that. The, along those same lines, do you have, uh, could like blood levels of different hormones, inflammatory factors fit into that same multivariate analysis? Could you do that and is there data you could mine along those lines to, to demonstrate some pattern in PTSD and, and other forms of treatment. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> like, you know, you have your pattern of data that they've collected from those people, and then he's saying, well, what if you had blood levels that have some kind of neuroendocrine inflammatory blood level right. markers? Yeah. And then could you also apply the same analysis, multivariate, and create the, the graph and all that? And is there data out there for you to do that to build such a, a model? Um, yes, we could do that. Um, I think anything that we can plug into this will provide useful information. And I know that there's been a lot of studies done already with ayahuasca to try and understand what it's doing in the body. So, I mean, we welcome data donations. I mean, my whole work that I do at, Sp at UCSF is, is taking previously published work and then trying to figure out how things, these new patterns in the data set to try and inform us about the disease model and the treatment. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Over what span of excuse me? Over what span of time do you think that um, uh, new research in uh, ayahuasca and PTSD would, is likely to take place? Um, so, like, in, including your own research, I suppose. Uh, you know, what what type of span time span can we expect to see? You know, kind of um, you know, clinical and experimental results and that sort of thing uh, developing. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of a slow process to get protocols approved. You have to write the protocol. It goes through review. Sometimes if it doesn't work, you have to go back to the drawing board and resubmit it. Um, that goes the same with any funding that you're trying to apply for. So it could potentially take a couple years to really get this to gain some momentum. Yeah, I don't know if you were at the opening remarks when Rick Doblin pointed out that for the MDMA studies that he was doing, he started his work when he was 18 years old, and hopefully by the time he's 70, it'll actually, he can start his profession. So, uh, you know, I think more of the goal, you know, it'll take some time, but the thing is, is that the more research that's getting started out there, the more that people can be informed. You know, the word can get out to the general public, these discussions can be opened up, and within the medical community, the discussion's opening up as well. Thank you. Yep. Oh, thank you. One more? Oh. You, you got time for one more. Sorry. Go for it. Wow, um, fantastic research. Thanks for sharing it. Just a quick question on, um, um, uh, you know, people who take ayahuasca regularly, um, or at least in, in, to some degree, will experience incredibly uh, difficult experiences of encounters with monsters and, and whatnot. And, um, and I've encountered people in, in Australia who have felt traumatized by the ayahuasca experience itself. And I'm wondering if um, the question of ritual or cultural mindset, um, I'm wondering what these two things play in processes of um, overcoming trauma, mm -hmm. not, to, not to say, you know, causing it. Yeah. Well, 
that brings up, you know, the whole re-experiencing thing is, I think, a really important thing to compare versus with like MDMA versus P uh, ayahuasca for PTSD treatment in that ayahuasca has the potential because it unleashes such un subconscious memories and there's ideas out there that ayahuasca is more ego dissolving and MDMA more ego building. So you, you want to kind of go into the treatment with a certain tool set and, you know, maybe not have quite as severe of symptoms of PTSD. Um, such as like extreme dissociation or hyperarousal. Um, but, you know, even the re-traumatizing, I think, to a certain degree, if you're capable of handling that, can be very useful in your healing process. Um, and I think, you know, for myself personally, I agree that the idea of ritual and the number one priority being, as I mentioned with exposure therapy, is creating a safe and controlled environment. And I think that ritual is part of creating that safe and controlled environment for people. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you everyone. <laughs> <laughs>